Hello and good evening everyone. My name is Jocelyn Stenner, Community Engagement Specialist for Durham Region at MetroLynx. It is my pleasure to be the moderator for this evening's event. On behalf of MetroLynx, I'd like to welcome everyone viewing online to this evening's live event as part of the fourth Public Information Centre for the Durham Scarborough Bus Rapid Transit Project. MetroLynx is proposing a more frequent and reliable transit service for Durham Region and the City of Toronto through the Durham Scarborough BRT project. To get there, a transit project assessment process or TPAP will need to be completed. The TPAP is a focused impact assessment created specifically for transit projects regulated under Ontario's Environmental Assessment Act. The TPAP for the Durham Scarborough BRT project commenced October 14th, 2021. Public Information Centre number four will be open on MetroLink's Engage until November 11th, 2021. We encourage you to review and share your feedback on the PIC4 materials and most recent preliminary designs plans for each municipality. We also encourage you to use our interactive map available online. I want to thank you again for your interest in joining us here this evening. Please note that this event is being closed captioned. To use this feature, please enable it on your video player. I'd like it to take a moment uh, for a land acknowledgement. So MetroLynx acknowledges that it operates on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples, including the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. In particular, these lands are covered by 20 treaties, and we have a responsibility to recognize and value the rights of Indigenous nations and peoples and conduct business in a manner that is built on the foundation of trust, respect, and collaboration. MetroLinks is committed to building meaningful relationships with Indigenous peoples and to working towards reconciliation with the original caretakers of this land. MetroLynx remains committed to engaging with Indigenous peoples and nations on the Durham Scarborough Bus Rapid Transit Project. I would now like to take a moment to talk about safety. Safety is central to everything we do, whether it's our colleagues, customers, or community. At MetroLynx, we're committed to putting safety first in everything we do. I'd like to begin with a safety moment. As many of us slowly start transitioning back to the office, we know that some of you will return to using Go Transit as part of your daily commute once again. A reminder that face coverings are mandatory on all Go Transit train and bus services. We encourage you to visit gotransit.com to find out what has changed since you've last used our services. I'd now like to talk about format and expectations for this evening's event. Um, we will begin with a brief overview of the project. After the presentation concludes, we will be taking written questions submitted via our comment form on MetroLynx Engage. From there, my colleague Stephanie Cardenas will be taking the lead in moderating the Zoom room, where participants will have the opportunity to ask their questions live directly to our panel. We have scheduled this session to last an hour and a half. Our goal is to take as many questions as possible. We often see a lot of similar themes in the written questions submitted. So if you have not done so, I'd ask that you scroll through the existing questions. And if you see one that covers your area of interest, please vote it up or like it. This will allow us to answer as many different types of questions as possible. We will be answering questions based on popularity of votes. A reminder that you can submit a new question at any time during the presentation. For questions we were unable to get to during the event, we will be posting answers on MetroLink's Engage. We ask that you please be mindful that conduct inconsistent with our policies will result in the removal of your comments and questions. We encourage all attendees to be respectful and keep the conversation relevant to the Durham Scarborough BRT project. Again, if you've just joined us, our event is being closed captioned. To use this feature, simply enable it on your video player. MetroLynx is committed to continuing the conversation about the Durham Scarborough BRT and look forward to continued engagement uh, with your communities throughout the next stages of this important transit project. I would now like to introduce our wonderful panel for this evening. Uh, so we have here David Phelps, Senior Manager, Community Engagement for Toronto East from MetroLynx, Kristen DeMassey, Senior Advisor, Rapid Transit Project Planning from MetroLynx, Utan Samuels, Environmental Project Manager from MetroLynx, 
Margaret Park Hill, Consultant Lead from Parsons IBI Group, and David Hopper, Consultant Lead, Parsons IBI Group. With that, I'd now like to pass it over to my colleague, David Felt, to share a few words ahead of this evening's presentation. Over to you, David. Thanks very much, Jocelyn. Um, I'm David. I'm uh, the Senior Manager for Community Relations for Toronto East, uh, part of which uh, this project passes. And I want to thank you for joining us this evening for DSBRT uh, Public Information Centre number four. We are thrilled to be collaborating with the Durham Region, Durham Region Transit, the City of Toronto, and the Toronto Transit Commission on planning and design of this rapid transit corridor. In this stage of the process, uh, the project, we know that there are many questions and concerns. Our team is here to listen and understand. If you feel your questions not been addressed by the end of the live event, please contact us at metrolinksengage.com or by email at dsbrt at metrolinks.com. We value the communities we work with and we want to ensure that we are working towards a better transit system for Durham and for Scarborough. With that, let me turn the presentation over to Margaret Parkhill, Consultant Lead at Parsons IBI Group. Thanks very much, David, and good evening, everyone. Next slide, please. The map on the screen shows the study area for the Durham Scarborough Bus Rapid Transit Project. It's a 36 kilometer study corridor spanning Ellesmere Road, Kingston Road, Dundas Street, King Street, and Bond Street in Oshawa. The project will connect urban growth centres in Scarborough, Pickering and Oshawa, as well as many other important trip generators and destinations along the corridor. This project is part of Metrolinx's frequent rapid transit network. Other projects are planned, including rapid transit on Shepherd Avenue in Toronto, the Scarborough subway extension, Eglinton East Light Rail Transit, as well as improvements to GoRail service and the Bowmanville extension, extension and other rapid transit projects across Durham Region. Note that the Bus Rapid Transit Corridor is intended to serve different people and places than the GO train. Bus Rapid Transit will generally serve shorter distance trips that start and end along Ellesmere Road, Kingston Road and Highway 2. Next slide. As I mentioned, Durham Scarborough Bus Rapid Transit is 36 kilometers of dedicated transit infrastructure connecting downtown Oshawa, Whitby, Ajax, Pickering, and Scarborough. The service will be operated by Durham Region Transit and builds on the success of the Pulse 900 route that currently operates through Durham Region and terminates at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. The goal of the project is to provide more dedicated transit infrastructure along Highway 2 and Ellesmere Road. Next slide. When we talk about bus rapid transit, we focus often on the dedicated lanes for buses. We know that providing a dedicated space for transit will improve travel times, re result in a more reliable and efficient transit service. But it's more than just the lanes. It's also a frequent service, so you don't have to check a schedule. You know that there'll be a bus along every five minutes or less during rush hours. There'll be smart traffic signals installed along the corridor. This will support smoother traffic flow, not just for the buses, but also for general traffic. We're looking at better transit connections and seamless transfers to routes in Toronto, Durham, and Go Transit bus routes. The reliable surface service will also result in more efficiencies, so we'll get more bang for our buck from operating transit in the corridor. Next slide. So what is the transit project assessment process? This is a streamlined environmental assessment created specifically for transit projects in the province of Ontario. You can see the image at the bottom of the screen that there's been many stages of planning before we started this part of the planning process. During the transit project assessment process, we have a regulated timeline for consultation to complete assessing the impacts, developing mitigation measures and documenting the project. From here, the project would move forward into detailed design, eventually into procurement and then to construction and operation. Next slide. Through the transit project assessment process, we focus on matters of provincial importance, and those are categorized into four main themes as shown on the screen. Indigenous relations, natural heritage, 
hydrology or the movement of water, as well as cultural heritage and archaeology. And I'll touch on each of these four themes later in the presentation. Next slide. At the last formal round of public consultation that we had back in the, the end of 2020, we had identified four, 49 proposed stop locations. And those same 49 stop locations remain in the project today. The bus rapid transit stops would always be located at a signalized intersection so that there's a protected way for pedestrians to cross and reach the transit platform. The image on the screen also summarizes how many stops are proposed within each of the five municipalities along the corridor. And we'll talk more about the design in a few slides. Next stop, uh, next slide, please. In the city of Toronto, the project starts, the infrastructure, I should say, starts at Grangeway Avenue, which is just east of McCowan Road. Looking at this west end of the corridor along Ellesmere Road from Grangeway Avenue to Morningside Avenue, we're proposing to widen Ellesmere Road to a six lane cross section. Today, Ellesmere Road is four lanes and will maintain those same four lanes for general traffic while widening the road to add space for two dedicated center running transit lanes. The project also includes cycling infrastructure through this stretch and new wider sidewalks along Ellesmere Road. Heading east from Morningside Avenue through the campus area with Centennial College and UTSC, the design is compatible with the proposed Eglinton East light rail transit project. That means that the buses will move into the curb lanes and serve curbside platforms at Military Trail. The dedicated transit lanes will pick up again east of Military Trail. Again, from that point around Military Trail heading over to Kingston Road, we're proposing center running transit lanes. The design here has changed since the last time we had formal consultation. Hearing from the community and working closely with City of Toronto, the design has been changed to now propose a four lane cross section, so much, much the same as what's there today. Converting the two centre lanes for traffic for transit and maintaining one general traffic lane in each direction. Again, the project will provide dedicated cycling infrastructure on each side of Ellesmere Road and new wider sidewalks. From there, the route turns and heads onto Kingston Road. Along Kingston Road, we're working closely with MTO to develop a solution for a six lane cross section. Again, most of Kingston Road is already five or six lanes wide, so we'll convert lanes and dedicate them for transit and then keep four general traffic lanes, two in each direction. You'll see a note on the map at Raspberry Road. That might not be familiar to you, but that's the last city street before the Rouge Valley. So from that point, heading east to Durham Region, we're proposing the buses will run in mixed traffic, and that way we avoid any impacts to the Rouge Valley and the Rouge National Urban Park. I also want to highlight there's a little asterisk beside numbers three and four on the screen. So that section of Ellesmere Road from about Conlins Road to Kingston Road. And for that stretch of Ellesmere Road, Metrolinx is committed to continue working with the City of Toronto to investigate interim solutions for the corridor. Next slide, please. In the city of, city of Pickering, the preferred design is consistent from end to end. So from Altona Road in the west to Notion Road in the east, we're proposing a six lane cross section. Parts of Kingston Road have already been widened to provide curbside bus lanes, and that design was done with this conversion to center running transit lanes in mind. As part of this project, again, there'll be one-way cycle tracks installed on each side of Kingston Road, new wider sidewalks to fill in any gaps that exist. Next slide, please. In the town of Ajax, again, starting at the west end and moving east, that six-lane cross-section will continue at the boundary between Pickering and Ajax. So that's number one on the image on the screen. As we head into the historic Pickering Village area, we needed to come up with a context sensitive solution to protect the Heritage Conservation District. There is also a cemetery on the south side and the buildings are located quite close to Kingston Road. This is also a change since the last public information centre. The proposed design is a five lane cross section. So that means two lanes for eastbound general traffic, 
two lanes in the center dedicated for transit and one westbound lane for general traffic. This change was in response to what we heard from the community with concerns about traffic infiltration and congestion through Pickering Village if we were to maintain a four lane cross section. So that's number two on the slide between Elizabeth Street and Rother Glen. And then heading east from Rother Glen to the boundary between Ajax and Whitby at Lake Ridge Road. Again, we're looking at a six lane cross section with two lanes in the center for transit, four lanes for general traffic, that's two in each direction, a one way cycle track on each side, and new wider sidewalks. Next slide, please. In the town of Whitby, again, the design has evolved since the last time we were out uh, doing formal rounds of public consultation, although we did have additional meetings in the town of Whitby over the last several months. Again, I'll walk through the design starting at the west end on the left hand side of your screen and heading to the east. Starting at Lake Ridge Road, uh, number 1A that you see on the slide. Again, that's the six lane cross section that you've heard me say several times so far tonight with two lanes in the centre for buses and four lanes for general traffic. As we head into the historic part of Whitby, the buildings become set closer to the road, closer to Dundas Street. Section 1B on the screen, which is between Raglan Street and Cochrane Street, is a five lane cross section. That's with two eastbound traffic lanes, two lanes dedicated for transit in the centre and one westbound lane. Continuing east from Cochrane Street, uh, for those of you who are from Whitby or who travel this stretch, you'll know that the buildings again get a bit closer to Dundas Street and we had to make some trade-offs in the design. The approach we're proposing is a four-lane cross-section, converting two lanes for transit and maintaining one lane in each direction for general traffic. Then right at the intersection of Church Street, the proposal is to, again, narrow the space available to vehicles so that we can create more space for pedestrians. A three lane cross section is proposed for that one block stretch from Byron Street to Brock Street. That's with one eastbound lane for traffic, one eastbound lane for transit and one westbound lane, which will be accommodating both transit and, tra and general traffic. As we continue east from Brock Street, the cross section becomes a four lane road. Again, two lanes for buses and two lanes for general traffic, one in each direction. And then from Garden Street, continuing east to the Oshawa boundary, the preferred design is a six lane cross section with those two lanes for transit, four lanes for general traffic. We're also proposing a multi use path on one side of Dundas Street and a new wider sidewalk on the other. Next slide. That six lane cross section continues, so it matches up between Whitby and Oshawa, continuing to the location where King Street and Bond Street split. Uh, so those of you familiar with this part of uh, Oshawa, this is happening just west of Stevenson, just east of Waverly Street. So number one on the screen is that six lane cross section. And then the buses will transition and operate in dedicated curbside lanes. And again, we made this decision to be compatible with the existing one way operation of King Street and Bond Street in Oshawa. So number two on the screen, that's King Street, where the buses will head eastbound in a curbside lane and will maintain two lanes for general traffic. The dedicated bus lane goes all the way to Simcoe Street. In the westbound direction, I got on Bond Street or number three on the screen, there'll be a curbside lane for buses and maintain two lanes for general traffic. There'll also be new wider sidewalks on both King and Bond Street. Next slide, please. So while the dedicated lanes end at Simcoe Street, we also have to figure out how the buses will turn around when they get to the end of the route. The map on the screen shows how eastbound the buses will continue on King Street to Ritson and then turn to access a layover location on William Street. This location has been identified in consultation with Durham Region, Durham Region Transit and the City of Oshawa. From there, buses would turn around and then head west on Bond Street to continue their service and access the dedicated lanes at Simcoe Street. Next slide, please. 
traveling 36 kilometers back to the west end of the route. Uh, similarly, we had to figure out how the buses will turn around at the west end. You may be aware that the Scarborough subway extension is planned and a bus terminal is proposed on the east side of McCowan Road near Progress Avenue. So that's just north of Ellesmere Road. Early on in the study, we actually heard from residents that the intersection of McCowan and Ellesmere is quite congested and it might result in more reliable service if we could avoid that intersection. Taking that idea and also working closely with the Scarborough subway extension team, the plan for Durham Scarborough Bus Rapid Transit is to carry the dedicated lanes as far as Grangeway Avenue and then have the buses turn and use Grangeway Avenue to head north from Ellesmere and access the future terminal with the Scarborough subway extension. The buses could then turn around into the terminal after serving the passengers, head back south on Grangeway and then get back into the dedicated transit lanes on Ellesmere Road to head eastbound. Next slide. As we mentioned at the start of the meeting, we're into the transit project assessment process. And as part of this environmental assessment, we need to look at a wide range of natural environment and social environment conditions. The purpose of these studies is to identify any potential impacts, both positive and negative, and develop mitigation measures to reduce or avoid any negative potential impacts. These mitigation measures will be documented in the environmental project report. And this report will be posted for public review early in 2022. On the next few slides, I'll give some highlights of our findings so far. Next slide, please. In terms of the natural environment and the detailed tree inventory that we've conducted, we're seeing impacts similar to other road reconstruction projects. During detailed design, there'll be opportunities to reduce the project footprint and reduce impacts to natural areas, the watercourses and street trees along the route. Some of the mitigation measures that we'll, we're recommending, there are many more that we don't have listed on the screen, but just to give a couple of highlights that might be of interest to you. We'll look at protecting existing street trees during construction. We'll also look at timing the construction to certain times of year to avoid um, things like migrating birds or other migrating wildlife. There will also be opportunities to improve habitat and to improve the passage of wildlife, wildlife and fish across the corridor. We can also look at mitigating invasive species that currently exist and replant with native species. Next slide. We've conducted both cultural heritage and archaeology studies. Generally, the preferred design fits within the existing road allowance, so that minimizes impacts to properties along the corridor. Again, during detailed design, we'll look for ways to reduce or avoid impacts. There will also be additional studies to specify the mitigation measures for any built heritage resources, cultural heritage landscapes, and areas with archaeological potential. This work will be done in consultation with local heritage advisory committees, Indigenous nations, and the Ministry of Heritage. We're also recommending cemetery investigations at three locations where their project is within 10 meters of known cemetery properties. And during construction, just like all other roadway projects, if there are any unexpected archaeological materials found as the construction proceeds, then work would stop and the site would be protected until a licensed archaeologist could assess. Next slide. Looking at stormwater and structures, we've identified 32 structures along the corridor. 28 of those are watercourse crossings or drainage crossings, and four of those are railway or highway crossings. So we're looking at each individual structure to identify recommendations of how to treat the structure. In some cases, the, the structure is near the end of their um, life cycle, so the structure may be rehabilitated or replaced entirely. In other locations, we may need to make modifications to the structure to accommodate the bus lanes, cycling infrastructure, and wider sidewalks. We're also looking at increasing climate resiliency to more severe storm events. So looking at each watercourse crossing to potentially increase the size of the crossing to meet current hydraulic standards. Next slide. 
Another note on air quality and climate change. We know from the initial business case that was completed in 2018 that encouraging more sustainable transportation choices will improve climate resiliency and reduce greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases. We're looking at mitigation measures during construction to reduce and manage dust and to reduce emissions from construction equipment. Once the uh, transit system is operational, we know that there'll be reduced tailpipe emissions with greener transit vehicles as uh, both Toronto and Durham Region are looking at moving to electric fleets. We'll see an overall benefit in the reduction of greenhouse gas em emissions and there'll also be opportunities for street trees and other landscaping features along the corridor. Next slide. In terms of noise and vibration, we know that traffic is the primary source of noise along Ellesmere Road and Highway 2. We've done detailed studies at about 40 sensitive locations and recommended mitigation measures, including using lower vibration construction equipment, restricting construction to certain hours of the day, as well as introducing noise barriers in compliance with MTO, Toronto and Durham Region guidelines. Next slide. The socioeconomic and land use study looked at employment areas along the corridor, retail and service industries, office and institutional land uses. Metrolinx is committed to working with the community and each of those different types of employment areas Metrolinx will establish community liaison committees as the project proceeds into detailed design. These committees will give local residents, community associations and businesses an opportunity to speak directly with Metrolinx before construction begins and as construction proceeds. Next slide. I wanted to just highlight for active transportation. I through the design review, I mentioned several locations where we're adding in sidewalks and building new cycling in, cycling facilities. Uh, I may have used the term cycle track quite frequently. So the image on the screen illustrates what a cycle track is. It's not the same as a bike lane. It's not located on the roadway. The cycle track is actually raised to the same height as the sidewalk and it's located behind the curb. So this creates a physical separation between traffic and cyclists and creates a safer space to encourage more people to also choose cycling for some of their trips. We're also looking at bike, party, bike parking near transit stops to connect cyclists to the transit route. Next slide. We're often asked when will construction start? And as I'm sure you can imagine, we can't build 36 kilometers of a roadway all at one time. So we're looking at staging the implementation or staging the construction throughout the corridor. Durham Region has applied for and received some funding. So they're proceeding with construction plans for sections of Pickering, Ajax and the west end of Whitby. That construction could start as early as 2022. A second phase of construction would start perhaps in 2024 for other sections of Pickering and other pieces of the town of Ajax. As you can see on the screen, there are still other sections of the corridor that would proceed after that. And we'll look further at this timing plan through the preliminary design business case. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, certain sections of Kingston Road have already been widened in Pickering and Ajax to create curbside bus lanes. That means the construction duration in those sections, it will take less time to convert the road space with the center median bus lanes. The design of the curbside bus lanes was planned for this future conversion to center running transit lanes. Construction along the corridor will depend on funding, property acquisition, permits and approvals. And as I mentioned, this transit project assessment process is just one step in the planning study. Um, after this, the project would move into detailed design before construction would begin. Next slide. That covers all the technical information that we wanted to cover this evening. So I'll just quickly touch on next steps before we open it up for questions. The transit project assessment process started on October 14th and we're running this phase of an engagement until November 11th. So tonight is our last live event, but we're open to having uh, comments written in to the website up until November 11th. 
We'll then take all of the feedback that we're hearing from the public, from technical agencies, and from stakeholders, and include that in the documentation. The environmental project report will be available for public review and comment. That's planned for January of 2022. And once the report is ready, we'll issue a notice to provide details of when and how to access the report. The public will have a 30-day review period to provide any further comments. In the meantime, we're also working on the preliminary design business case, and that's also planned to be released in early 2022. On the slide, you can see our project mailing list, uh, dsbrt at metrolinks.com. You can reach the project team through that email address or request to be signed up to the project mailing list. Next slide. So thanks again for attending, and I'll turn it back to Jocelyn. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, so for those of you who have just joined us, thank you for participating in the Durham Scarborough Bus Rapid Transit Virtual Open House as part of Public Information Center number four. My name is Jocelyn Stenner, Community Engagement Specialist uh, for Durham Region with Metrolinks. This event is being closed captioned. To use this feature, enable it on your video player. Uh, I just want to reintroduce the panel for this evening. Again, if you're just joining us. So we have David Phelps, Senior Manager, Community Engagement, Toronto East at Metrolinks. Kristen DeMassey, Senior Advisor, Rapid Transit Project Planning with Metrolinks. Uton Samuels, Environmental Project Manager, Metrolinks. Margaret Parkhill, Consultant Lead, IBI Parsons Group. David Hopper, Consultant Lead, IBI Parsons Group. So our panel is ready to answer uh, the written questions that have been submitted. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to get into some of those written questions now um, before we go uh, to the Zoom or live room uh, later this evening. So with that, uh, the first question that we have received was where and how will the BRT connect to Scarborough Town Center? Um, so maybe I'll go ahead and uh, pass it over to the panel to go ahead uh, with that one. Thanks, Jocelyn. I can start that one. Uh, there was actually a slide on that. I'm not sure if it would help to go back to the slide or I can just describe it in words. Um, maybe three more. It was in the. That's the one. Sorry, forward one. Thank you so much. So the plan is to continue the dedicated transit lanes on Ellesmere Road as far as Grangeway Avenue. And then at Grangeway Avenue, the buses would turn north, head up Grangeway Avenue to connect to the proposed bus terminal, which will connect to the Scarborough subway extension. So that's on the east side of McCowan near Progress Avenue. Thanks. So just just to add to that, so we we are coordinating with that project team. So they're looking at the number of bus bays that are located inside a consolidated bus facility to serve the BRT service along with all the other bus routes servicing the subway. And they will also be looking at any improvements that are needed along Grangeway, to both to serve the BRT and other bus routes that are going to and from the subway station. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, David. So we're going to go ahead and go to the next question, and it's around um, safety and cycling uh, infrastructure. So a couple of things with this one. So will there be dedicated bike lanes? Um, and with that, will there be safe ways to cross the street to access destinations and walkability, um, safe walkability within that? So maybe if we can um, answer that question and also being mindful um, of the Vision Zero, maybe we can incorporate a little bit of that into the answer. I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you. Thanks, Jocelyn. So as I mentioned through the review of the preliminary design, most of the corridor is going to see dedicated cycling infrastructure, which doesn't really exist along Ellesmere Road or Highway 2 today. Uh, as I mentioned, that's going to be raised cycle tracks for the most part. In a few sections, we'll have a multi-use path um, where cyclists and pedestrians would share the facility, but the majority of the corridor is going to see a raised cycle track, and that means the cycling facility is raised up to the height of the sidewalk and located behind the curb. 
So it's got sort of a horizontal as well as a vertical, a physical separation from traffic. And we find that that's a much safer way for cyclists to get around um, and also will encourage more cycling use along the corridor, which goes hand in hand with transit usage. In terms of safety, we're looking at all of the intersections to increase both accessibility and safety. So specifically for cyclists, we're looking at cross rides. So you might be familiar with the term crosswalk, where there is a painted area across the intersection to designate a, a safe space for pedestrians. A similar idea, but for cyclists, is to paint a cross ride through the intersection. So we're making sure to protect for space at the intersections for cross rides as well. And in terms of accessibility features, every intersection that we touch will be upgraded with tactile warning plates, um, accessible signals, uh, walk signals, and in some cases even cycling uh, traffic signals as well. Uh, you mentioned Vision Zero, um, which definitely we're seeing a huge benefit to the safety of all road users along the corridor. One of the features of the bus rapid transit with the dedicated lanes being in the center of the road is the introduction of a raised island. So that's not a tall, like a Jersey barrier idea. It's really the height of a, a sidewalk. It's about six inches tall, but it's located in the center of the road. And that means that left turns won't be able to happen at unsignalized locations or at mid-block locations. Instead, all left turns will happen at a signalized intersection. And we've seen in York Region a huge safety benefit from this, from this change, from this change to left turn access, um, 50 to 75 percent reduction in collisions. So that'll benefit pedestrians, cyclists and the general, pop, um, general traveling public as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. So the next uh, question is around um, Ellesmere Road and the configuration. So what will that lane configuration uh, look like and how will existing um, bus service be affected and what the future uh, service levels will look like with the pulse? Um, so if you could speak a little bit to that, that would be wonderful. Sure, I'll keep rolling and others on the panel are welcome to jump in. Um, so along Ellesmere Road, again, the west end of Ellesmere Road, where today there's already, I think, four different TTC bus routes that operate between um, sort of McCowan and uh, Morningside there at, at University of Toronto and, and Centennial College. The proposal there is to have uh, six lanes, so widening Ellesmere from the four lanes that it is today, widening it to six lanes to create space in the centre for to dedicated transit lanes and maintain the four lanes for cars. Uh, we're seeing benefits to traffic operations as well as the increase to transit reliability for that stretch of Ellesmere Road by separating transit from general traffic. Heading east from the campus area, so from about Military Trail or um, Conlins Road, we will not be widening Ellesmere Road. Instead, we'll be converting the two centre lanes to transit only and maintaining one lane in each direction for general traffic. Again, with the active transportation, with the cycling infrastructure and sidewalks as well. In terms of free, oh, sorry, David, do you want to jump in there? No, I was going to talk go about ahead. frequency. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, so part of the project is also to provide more frequent service. So the Durham Region Transit Pulse route today ends at University of Toronto Scarborough campus there at Military Trail. So part of this project will be extending that service operated by Durham Region Transit and extending it to connect over to Scarborough Centre. But the TTC buses will also be able to use the dedicated lanes. So that will make the TTC service more reliable and more efficient as well. And we're working with TTC to understand how their routes will change with the introduction of this infrastructure. Uh, the other final point I'll just add, uh, I think I mentioned during the presentation, is the idea of having freedom from looking at the schedule. So by having this frequent service, this five minute or less service along the corridor, you won't have to check the schedule before you leave your house to catch the bus. Uh, you'll be able to walk out and know that there'll be a, a vehicle along shortly to take you where you want to go. Wonderful. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so I just want to take a quick moment before we get to the next question. If there are folks watching on the event page and they're interested in joining the Zoom or the live room where you'll get to ask a live question to the panel, there should be uh, a join Zoom, a little yellow button within the page. You're just going to want to go um, through that route and follow the steps just to get into the to the Zoom room. Uh, so with that, I'll go to the next um, question. So. Uh, it's a larger question, so it's around um, some support for the project. So while 
there's a comment that they understand there's some opposition, but there's also lots of support for the project um, and how how the project will benefit um, the region as a whole, including employment opportunities, local business, and how organizations can benefit from this as a whole. So I wonder if uh, maybe Kristen can start with this and then um, Margaret and David, if you want to kind of jump in afterwards. Sure. Um, so I'll start. It, the project, um, so when we look at these corridors, it's, it's part of what we call the regional transportation network, so plan. Um, and so we, you know, we plan these things as, as, as part of a network of improvements. So we look at how people get around today, uh, you know, where the population is, where the employment is, and where that's going to be in the future. Uh, and so, you know, that all gets calibrated into, a, into modeling. Um, and then we sort of, we plan trans, different kinds of transit networks around that. And so the aim is to really uh, connect people where they want to go uh, in the future, where we think there's going to be a lot of population, different kinds of employment, uh, where that growth is going to be around the region. Um, and what kind of transit services and rapid transit we need to connect to. So, you know, you, you have the Go Transit line, which sort of services that uh, long term, or well, long commutes between the 905 and the City of Toronto. You have municipal service buses that both feed into the, to the Go line, and then you have sort of the TTC subway um, and light rail transit as well. So this corridor, um, work that we've done shows the population and employment growth along both in Scarborough and Durham. Uh, fast rapid transit is the best technology um, that will meet the needs of, of the corridor. It will, uh, it will be, it will assist people in where they need to go and it will also sort of um, create those additional opportunities for people to travel uh, and to work around the region. So, that's kind of the, the 40,000 feet um, look at it. And then I think, you know, when, when you're talking about people living in the community and the benefits to them, the project sort of, there's a lot of other benefits uh, associated with this, this sort of infrastructure, which, you know, is not really talked about. Like, you know, Margaret talked about cycle lanes. Um, that's a huge benefit to the community. Um, you know, we know that when we put dedicated and safe cycle infrastructure in place, people people use it. And so, you know, you have those benefits. You have brand new sidewalks, wider sidewalks. It's more accessible for people. Um, and you also have this sort of this um, chain reaction in, in, a, in the bus network plan. So while we're talking about the corridor and bus service on Ellesmere and frequency and all of that stuff, as the time goes on and what happens is the bus network sort of evolves around that corridor and you'll find, um, you know, TTC and DRT services will change and evolve to to meet the demand on the corridor and services become more frequent on kind of those north and south routes uh, and you'll get better connections to, um, to this corridor and to other sort of areas around within Scarborough and, and Durham. So I think, you know, when you're asking about benefits to the the area that there are some huge benefits to both Scarborough and Durham by this project. Um, Margaret, do you, do you have any other technical things Sorry, to add? Sorry, Kristen, I was going to I was going to add to that. So, I mean, it, what it really comes down to is you, if you looked, uh, you know, when I was growing up out in the suburbs, you had to look for a, a, a your first job as a teenager as somewhere that you could walk to or bicycle to. But now in this corridor, when BRT is here, it's going to be open to uh, you know teenagers getting their first job anywhere along the corridor. So what it really does is it opens up more opportunity for people who live on the corridor, for people who don't have a car, or people who choose not to drive. Um, and it'll also open up more opportunities for those businesses. So they'll be able to draw on a larger labor pool because there'll be more opportunity for people to get there. And adding the uh, active transportation alongside transit, they work together. So on good weather days, you can ride your bike and on bad weather days, you can take the bus. But both of those mean that families don't have to buy a second or a third car. They can get away with one or two cars. So there's fewer trips are made by automobiles. So we're going to see less pollution. 
when we see more transit usage, we also see less congestion. So there's a, a whole series of benefits that come out of this project uh, in terms of increasing accessibility and increasing mobility and giving people more choice and more ways to travel and more opportunities of places to travel to. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, David. Uh, Margaret, was there anything you wanted to add on that one? I'll just uh, I'll just jump in with uh, sorry, sorry, Margaret. I'll just jump in uh, as uh, an occasional uh, Route 38 bus rider. You know, when I when I when I look at that question, I'm sort of the people that are on the bus now and going to those institutions, going to those schools, going to the Centenary Hospital. Um, you know. Uh, the, the sports fields along uh, that, and I'm thinking sort of a little bit Scarborough centric there, but the, you know, those people and those institutions all benefit from uh, people having better access to that. So the people benefit and then the institutions uh, have an opportunity to be more successful and, you know, uh, attract more workers. And then I think the other thing, and then David touched it on, is, uh, you know, that bridging uh, ability to, to sort of minimize the impact on the border for between uh, um, between Durham and, and Scarborough. I think that's going to be a, a huge benefit to people so that it's as easy to go uh, east into Pickering or Ajax as it is to go from uh, there into Scarborough. And I think uh, like David was saying in terms of jobs, whether it's for a teenager or, or for people at other stages in their lives, it just increases opportunities. Thank you, David. Uh, so we'll go to the next question. Uh, so when will shovels go into the ground for this project? Um, and then there's some background here just about uh, some projects in the, the east seemingly being uh, delayed for some time. So uh, Bowmanville was listed there. So when specifically will the east get some enhancement to their transit um, projects. So I, I believe this will probably be a collective effort, so I'll toss it over um, to the panel and see who wants to um, start first. So I can start. The, there was a slide we had there, and, and again, it's up on the website. If you want to take a closer look, I appreciate it might be hard to see all the details on the screen uh, this evening, but it is up on the website. So Durham Region has received some funding and they're proceeding to start some of the detailed design work in Pickering, Ajax and the West End of Whitby. Uh, again, this is all subject to approvals and funding and, and moving through this process to get into the detailed design process. Uh, so Durham Region is though actively working to advance this project within Durham Region. On the City of Toronto side, it may take a couple more years uh, as the city is still working on assembling the funding. And, and again, we have to go through the same approvals process and get through the detailed design as well. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, one of my Metrolinx colleagues would like to speak to, uh, you mentioned I think the Bowmanville extension or other projects in Durham. But I, I could speak to Bowmanville extension. The, the, the currently, well, we could say that the, right now with the GO train services, we're looking at the Bowmanville extension, which is going on, and current studies are going on at Metrolinx. So that is something we're looking at to uh, provide an extra service to Bowmanville. Um, with terms of uh, this project in particular, moving beyond the east, uh, or maybe not right now at this stage that we're looking and move into um, into Bowmanville area. Right now we're just going to service these um, major downtown areas and the core with, within this section, but it's something like a Bowmanville might be looked at in the future for sure. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to add on to that, but uh, uh, Bowmanville is in our sights. I could say that too, but I am somebody who lives in Durham, so I appreciate that that Metrolinx is looking into that. So um, it's it's not forgotten, that's for sure. And just I can touch a little bit on the the London project. I think and and uh, my colleagues know a lot more about the environmental assessment process than I. But uh, you know where you're just expanding a, a service on existing infrastructure, and you're not having to build new infrastructure. Um, there isn't the same requirement to to do an environmental assessment, and um, you know the environmental assessment rightfully is a you know it's a, a process where we're really looking for impacts, and and uh, I think that would be one of the difference. But I, I think all of the projects that that have been mentioned are you know we're we're looking to do them and looking to do them right. Thank you, everyone. So the next question will uh, be about. 
the project, the DSBRT project, and how that might impact local businesses during the delivery stage. So specifically, um, business uh, revenue and supports um, and tra local traffic infiltration, um, increased traffic. So some of those concerns. So maybe David, do you want to start with this and just some of the ways from the community engagement lens um, we support and then we can kind of open it up if there's any other comments. Oh, you, you double, you double unmuted yourself, Dave. There you go. Sorry about that. I think I'd be better. Um, yeah, it's a great question, and thanks, Jocelyn. Um, I think uh, where where we start to work with the businesses is at this stage. We, we, you know, as you know, we've we've had lots of conversations. The businesses have brought us issues that we want to address, and so this is an important part of the process. But it's sort of is certainly not the last. As we move into detailed design, uh, there will be continued conversations with businesses looking. Uh, to avoid uh, to avoid issues that, that are going to cause uh, trouble, and then the question obviously specifically mentioned the construction phase of the project, and uh, you know Metrolinx has been doing a lot of projects in the in the region. Um, we do have measures in place to help uh, local businesses. Um, uh, I think there's been reference to some of our LRT projects, and in those situations, uh, again, we have uh, uh, liaison committees with the community, so we hear firsthand what their issues are. But we've also implemented programs to, uh, you know, things like shop local programs where we support the local businesses by um, uh, by letting, you know, buying, uh, doing programs that encourage people to continue to shop in their area, whether it's through advertising, uh, those kinds of measures. Um, and uh, we also, um, uh, sorry, sorry. We, we do things like, you know, if there's concerns about uh, parking that's lost sort of in the short term, we're always working with the municipalities to sort of see if there's alternatives, uh, make sure that uh, special arrangements are, are, are made when, uh, you know, for certain activities. So we're very, very local focused on these issues through the construction phase. So uh, continue to share your thoughts and concerns uh, from a business perspective. That'll help us make the project great. And then uh, Metrolinx is going to be there along the way to uh, work with not only businesses, but organizations and, and individual property owners. Uh, to make sure that the construction phase is as easy as possible, and I think, and I think this is a fair comment, and I'll, I'll let uh, someone challenge me if it isn't. But uh, the kind of construction for a BRT is less than you're going to get for uh, uh, an LRT or um, you know a lot of the subways underground. But when you build, you put the stations in, that can have a a, a greater impact. So, in some ways, the BRT construction impacts are are easier for the for the team and the the project to mitigate. And David, I could just also add to that that um, with um, what we're going to do is we, we have to break this into segments. We can't build the whole 36 kilometers at once. The intention is to find and do segments that we can build in one and possibly two construction seasons. So the idea isn't let's close down Highway 2 and Pickering for seven years and, and tear the whole thing up. It's to do it in logical chunks, the same way that some of the, the curbside lanes have been done. So there will be local impacts that are closer to you for a short period of time and then impacts that are further away from you at, at other times. And the intent is to try and do this as expeditiously as possible. And it's more like a road widening project than it is like an LRT project. So it, it definitely is faster than we've seen on the east end of Eglinton Avenue. Well, I just did the double double mute to myself as well. Thank you both for that. Uh, so we did get another uh, question or comment around Bowmanville, but I think we did touch on that a bit. So I'm going to move to the next one. Um, but again, we do post all of the uh, responses back to the page after the event. So you can look there uh, where we'll maybe touch on that into a little bit more detail, that response. So uh, we'll go to the next one and it's around how did you decide to reduce westbound lanes in downtown Whitby? Um, so you're still not listening. One block of wider sidewalks does not trump our neighborhoods. What was the decision uh, process and can you do a comparative um, side by slide presentation of all your options and why you chose this one? Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this one over on how we landed on the, the current three lane option in Whitby. So maybe I'll start and then others can can join in. So uh, when you go back to the beginning of this project, we in, in our first PIC, we talked about the evaluation criteria and how we were going to 
assess the options. So we set out a number of criteria in terms of uh, community impact, traffic impact, transit reliability, cost, Im impacts to the environment. We also identified early on that there were several parts of the corridor that are too narrow to be an optimal solution, the pinch points as we named them. So there's a pinch point at the east end of Ellesmere, one in Pickering Village, one in downtown Whitby, and one in downtown Oshawa. And then we focused on solutions in those areas. We looked at uh, implementing just transit signal priority, so leaving the buses at mixed traffic, but trying to get the traffic to move at the speed of a bus. We looked at HOV lanes where the curbs would be for buses and cars with more than two people in them. We looked at curbside BRT lanes. We looked at median lanes. And we looked at a whole range of options. The first thing we brought out to the public was curbside up four lanes through downtown Whitby, but buses in the curb lanes and cars in the middle lanes. And that was felt to really not address the town of Whitby's desire to make the downtown more pedestrianized, more business friendly. So we went back to have a look um, and then the idea came, well, we could make it much more attractive pedestrians and transit by eliminating car traffic and having only buses being able to travel on Dundas Street through that stretch. That gave good high transit priority. It gave great improvements to the public realm. However, it meant traffic would need to divert onto local side streets. So um, in the Goldilocks story, you know, that's the other the other end of the scale. So then we sat down with the town staff and with people in the community and said, is there a way to create this balance? And so after multiple uh, options, which are all documented uh, in the previous consultation and will be in our report, we ended up with the idea of a three lane solution. So the we know that traffic is heavier eastbound in the evening than it is westbound in the morning because of the way Highway 401 is structured. As you go westbound, the highway gets wider, so more people go to the highway immediately. In the evening coming eastbound, the highway gets narrower, is more congested, so more people get off the highway and find other routes. So the balance was to have a continuous eastbound through lane for traffic to handle the traffic, a continuous eastbound BRT lane, and in the westbound direction, we would have a, a car lane and a bus lane as far as Perry Street. Then they would mix for a very short segment getting through the downtown and then split back into the four lanes. That allows us to widen the sidewalks locally so that we can improve the accessibility of the stores. We've taken the on-street parking into an off-street lot in behind, so there's no loss in parking. Um, by having the, the through lane in the westbound direction, that's a route for trucks to go through, and it also will handle the vast majority of the traffic going through. What we also found in the traffic study was that by implementing the BRT, We'll actually control the amount of traffic that moves onto local side streets because we'll be carrying more people by public transit. We found in our analysis that without putting BRT in, what happens is that more people choose to drive and they will overwhelm the local road network and people will start using all of these side streets for routes that aren't as congested. So it was a little counterintuitive at first, but what we're finding is the BRT with the three lane solution will actually do a better job in the in the longer term of reducing traffic on local streets than a four lane solution and having transit operated mixed traffic and not being as reliable as it needs to be to carry people. So that's really how we got there. We looked at a number of other things. We looked at reversible lanes, which were challenging operationally for both bus drivers and the public to understand. It also requires a lot more signage that would have to be overhead like you see on places like the you know the Lionsgate Bridge or the, the San Francisco Bay Bridge where you have all the overhead signs that tell you which lane you can be in with green lights and red lights. We looked at um, you know a single lane that would be westbound exclusively in the morning and, and buses would be in the general lane and the eastbound would reverse in the afternoon. We found that was challenging for where do you place the stops and how do you get people to and from the bus and where are you supposed to wait? So what we really found that we think is the Goldilocks solution that does some improvement to the public realm. It provides a very high degree of transit priority and it provides enough traffic capacity to manage things out to 2041. I don't know if anyone wants to add to that. 
I'll just maybe jump in quickly. If you are interested to go back and watch some of the more detailed information that we presented specifically for Town of Whitby, uh, there were recorded live events. So through the project website on Metrolinks Engage, if you click on live events, you'll see there's an option for current events, but also for past events. And if you click on past events, you can watch the presentation and the recordings from January 7th, from March 16th, and from May 20th, where there's more detailed information capturing what David has just uh, recapped for you. I'll probably just add also uh, add in this uh, rapid transit service. So, you know, more people will actually use the transit service, which is uh, reliable and comes often and, and it's faster along this corridor instead of actually taking a vehicle also through this section. Uh, it will give them another option, especially going on to westbound areas where you're going to all these other servicing areas or to uh, employment and so on. So it, it also just provides an extra option for people and and th therefore hence not needing another a vehicle to go on the road as as when the thing about where as we grow in this community and all over the gth we're growing in population and more and more vehicle track is coming so having these services and and providing these uh, amenities uh, will help assist us in moving people across the region Thank you. Uh, so I think we're going to do one more written question, and I know we have some folks who have been waiting patiently over in the Zoom or live room ready to ask some live questions. So I'll go ahead and read one last question um, from Engage, and it's around allowing um, Scarborough Transit users to use DRT buses. Will there be any solution to Durham Region Transit buses not allowing transit users in Scarborough to hop on and off stops that are located within Toronto. Um, it seems ineffective and backwards not to allow those who want to use it exclusively within Toronto and Scarborough. So over to the panel. Yeah, I, I can I, start with that one. Oh, Kristen, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, um, yeah, that's a great question. And it's one of the key benefits of the entire project is um, we are, so today, Durham Region um, and the, the Toronto operates a closed door policy. So DRT doesn't stop and pick up within the city. So part of this project, um, DRT uh, services would stop and pick up passengers at all the stops in Scarborough, as well as the TTC uh, buses. So it, it effectively doubles the uh, transit availability um, today for, for residents in the community. Thanks, Kristen. Margaret, was there anything more that you wanted to add there? No, I think Kristen covered all of it. Yeah, it's really just about today, just as she mentioned, Durham Region Transit uh, operates closed doors within City of Toronto. So part of this project is to uh, open up that availability so that if you're on Ellesmere Road, you can take either a Durham Region bus or a TTC bus uh, to get where you need to go. And I'm not sure if Kristen or someone else from Metrolinx also wants to talk about fare integration, but we know that Metrolinx is working really hard with all the regional and local transit service providers to work towards fare integration across the network as well, which will be another added benefit as, as these kinds of projects move forward. And I just saw that there was another question on, on fares, just whether you'd have to pay a fare for a, a bus and then another fare for the BRT and then another fare when you got, got off the bus. Uh, I. I, I'll turn it over to somebody that uh, can confirm that, but that's not my understanding. Um, so the, the so fair integration is a is a large and complicated file um, at Metrolink, but so there there is a lot of work underway um, to improve fair integration across the entire network with with all the municipal service providers. So on this particular corridor, um, we are assuming uh, an integrated fare between. Durham and TTC buses on the corridor. So it wouldn't be a, a, a BRT fare, um, you know, to, to ride on, to get on a bus on Ellesmere Road. It would just be a, um, you know, whatever the fare is um, for a local bus to, that's what you would pay. Um, those conversations are ongoing and, and you know, will be uh, more um, fleshed out in the, in the future phases of work. Thanks, Kristen. 
And thanks everybody. So we're going to go head over to Stephanie, who's in the Zoom room and uh, get into some of those live questions. Stephanie, over to you. Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us in the Zoom room this evening and for patiently waiting to ask your question directly to our wonderful panel. If you are viewing this evening's session and have an interest in asking your question live, you can still join us in the Zoom room by selecting Join Zoom on the event page. If you are in the Zoom room and have not done so already, please use the raise hand function if you would like to be added to the speaker list. We will be taking questions in order in which they are received. We know that participants have a lot of great questions and comments for the panel. However, we have many participants with their hands up wanting an opportunity to ask their question live. We kindly ask that you keep to one question that is brief and relevant to the DSBRT project to ensure many people as many people as possible have an opportunity to ask the question to the, their question to the panel. For the questions, I will introduce the next speaker at that time. You will be taken off mute and can proceed to ask your question. We are continuing to refine our virtual engagement format based on your feedback and encourage you to complete the post event survey that will be available for one week after this event. The post event survey will be sent to all those that pre registered. If you did not register and would like to share your feedback on the format, please email DSPRT team directly at dsbrt at metrolinks.com. With that, let's go to some live questions. The first speaker is Marilyn. Go ahead, Marilyn, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question tonight. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, when it comes to the Durham region more specifically, uh, there's a lot of um, north-south uh, traffic that happens as well. And I know we're really focused here on the east-west routes, but unlike the TTC buses uh, that, you know, have lots of different routes in the Scarborough area going north, south, east, and west, I feel we don't have that same luxury here in the Durham region. And so even if we have buses going every five minutes during rush hour traffic, what are we doing to accommodate those who get off, say, at White's Road and then have to go north for another 10, 15 minute commute? Uh, are we expecting them to wait 15, 20 minutes for the next bus that might come around for that? And ultimately, at the end of the day, um, to make sure that people are going to want to use this, especially for all the inconvenience during the construction period, is there really going to be that much time saved taking this uh, public transportation versus individuals who would say it's more convenient for them to drive? So those are great questions. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start. So we, we think of the, 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 the east-west corridor and Highway 2 as the spine. We need to think of all of the major north-south streets as the ribs. So DRT is very carefully looking at how they're going to expand north-south services to tie into this. We're looking to make sure at the stops that it's convenient to get from a north-south bus route stop onto the east-west BRT and back and forth. We're also looking at next stop announcement signs so that if you do get off your, uh, your, your east-west trip, it'll tell you how long it is to make your connection to the north south so you can decide whether you need to you know hurry with the next light and go right to the stop or whether you have time to go for a coffee so there's some amenities we're trying to add there so that definitely is is part of the plan in terms of time saving uh, right now from end to end it's about 100 minutes so it's like an hour and three quarters to ride from uh, downtown Oshawa to Scarborough Center when we implement this this will save about 20 minutes off that trip about 10 minutes actually on the bus, but the reliability of the service also means you don't have to plan extra time in your schedule in case the bus is not running when you get there. So that's about a 10 to 15% time savings for everybody in the corridor. So it is a fairly significant time savings, uh, which we believe will be one of the things that helps drive up ridership. 
And I might just add to that as well, David, one of the benefits of bus rapid transit as compared to light rail transit is we're operating buses on a rubber tired vehicle. So there's flexibility and we've been talking already with Durham Region Transit about, you know, maybe there'll be some routes that use the bus lanes for a stretch through Pickering or Ajax, but then turn off, you know, at White's Road, at Salem Road um, and continue the route north south uh, to serve different areas of Durham Region. So I know they're looking closely at that as well. And that's one of the, the beautiful, flexible things about bus lanes is you can have different routes that share the same infrastructure. Thank you, Margaret and David. Our next question comes from Tim. Tim, go ahead. Question tonight. And uh, so great, David, to see your face again and being a transitional face in these consultations, all new faces other than that. Um, but I want to thank everyone for doing this uh, as we walk through these consultations. I have a question around vision. I'm a little, I'll have to say, Marilyn, you stole my thunder and I appreciate it. But um, I'm a little concerned by the north-south. I'm a Whitby resident, and most of our north-south in Whitby has been decimated. There is no north-south in my area anymore. I'm back in a car. Um, I'm worried that, I, I guess my question to the team is, who has the ultimate vision for what this is going to look like? Because I see a very strong uh, spine that's been described along Highway 2. I'm, I'm disappointed, to be honest, by the timelines. It's taking forever. Um, and quite frankly, by the time, I still believe by the time we're done, we're gonna wish we put an LRT in because that's what we'll need next and we'll dig it all up again in 10 years and do it again. But who, ha who ultimately is working on the vision of what, of, of what transit will look like in the Durham Clarington region? Because I look around the province and I see amazing things happening. And then I look around Durham and I see a seven year plan for bus lanes, maybe Bowmanville, and very little else happening. As a matter of fact, what I see is less. I'm back in a car after three years of taking Durham Transit. So, because there aren't, my, my route is gone. So who ultimately has that vision? Is it a shared vision? Is it just DRT? Who should we be lobbying? Because I, I really wish in some ways we had the York, the London, the Kitchener, the Ottawa vision for a really powerful transit future for Durham Region. I really think that's where we need to go. And I love these sessions because I get really uplifted by them. But then I get in my car and drive to work every day. So what, what, how do, how, who has that vision? And I'll, I'll turn that back to the team. So maybe I can start on some of the things that are happening on the ground. So there are, there are some other things that are happening. So we do know Metrolinx is uh, planning the Bowmanville co-train extension. There are other improvements on the Lakeshore East line that help. Uh, we have the Scarborough subway extension, uh, Eglinton East LRT, a little bit further than west, but still improvements in the east part of the region. We know that this has been the first priority because this is the busiest route in the system. We know that um, as part of the regional transportation plan, we're also looking, the region is going to be looking at a north-south service on, on Simcoe uh, Street in Oshawa to serve Durham College. There's thoughts about um, the next study would be looking at east-west service on Taunton Road. Uh, Durham Region Transit is always trying to look to see where to with the scarce resources they have to do this. It is all part of the regional transportation plan that is set out and led primarily by Metrolinx, but it has very strong input, not only from Durham Region and Durham Region Transit, but also the local municipal partners. So, um, you know, we've worked carefully with all four of the local municipalities to make sure this matches their vision. So we're serving the development that's coming to downtown Pickering. We're serving what we can in downtown Oshawa. And actually the Eastern Terminus is designed to to go far enough to find out what happens on Simcoe and Center Street to tie all that together. So there are things that are in the works and yes, it, it always takes a lot longer uh, to implement this than anyone would like. I don't know, David, did you want to add anything on the sort of the Metrolinx vision? Oh, you, you double muted yeah. yourself. Yeah, I, thanks for for those points, David. I think th those are great. As you highlight, you know, Lakeshore East is a is a line that uh, you know it's a, a good backbone of the transit of of Durham Region, and uh, it's it's being strengthened uh, as, so that more service can be provided. I know that the people of Durham have responded well to things like all day service, uh, 
increased frequency all day, uh, as well as uh, service on the weekends. It's uh, it's one of the services that's sort of coming back strongest, uh, strong through the, uh, through the COVID. So I think there's a, a real opportunity. I think if you provide good service, uh, people will use it and uh, hope you get your bus route back because uh, obviously, uh, the, our local partners are, are uh, a key part of it, um, and and I really believe there is that vision. Um, Kristen's working on a business uh, plan for the project, and it touches on, a, I, I believe, I, I'll speak for Kristen, but she might want to speak for herself. It, it touches on just those types of issues of, of what, what it takes to, to make the, the project uh, as successful as it can be. Yeah, and maybe I'll just jump in as well. Um, if you're ready to do some internet searching, you can search on Metrolinx's 2041 Regional Transportation Plan, and you'll see a whole series of maps of the whole greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Uh, so that sets out, as, as David and David mentioned, uh, the overall vision for the, the greater region within Metrolinx's purview, again, working closely with the municipalities. So this project is part of the Frequent Rapid Transit Network, uh, and all of those projects are in various stages of planning and development. Uh, we do know that local transit service has suffered during COVID. Um, however, we've heard from our colleagues at Durham Region Transit that the Pulse service along Highway 2 has actually not seen the significant change in ridership compared to some of the other routes. So again, we see that demand along the corridor and that the demand is sustained even during these COVID times. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that you lost your route, but hopefully it does come back. We know Durham Region is looking at, again, implementing new service now that we're on the road to reopening, uh, so to speak. And we've talked before about the connections that this project will provide to those north-south routes. Oh, I also wanted to mention the Durham Region Transportation Master Plan. Uh, there's lots more good tidbits in there about the, the vision of transportation for Durham Region in the future. Thank you, Margaret. Okay, uh, our next question comes from William. William, go ahead. Hi there, uh, thanks for the meeting uh, tonight. Uh, it's very appreciated. Um, I'm, I'm a Scarborough Center uh, resident and uh, so kind of interested to see that it's ending at uh, Grangeway. Um, I think it kind of makes sense, but I. But one thing that um, I, I had known that there was some uh, you know planning going into like the street grid, especially in that McCowan precinct area, um, to kind of uh, in a way like beef up the streets there and and make them more uh, higher capacity. Um, so I was just wondering like how the um, uh, rapid bus uh, line will kind of. In interface with that uh, planning and um, you know with especially with the the bus terminal proposed to be on the opposite side of the um, of the future Scarborough Center station um, you know how, how are those connections going to work like is it kind of an underground connection or um, what would you uh, have any info or insight on that so that's a great, great question, and there is a lot of work going on in that area. So there's studies around the road network, around where the subway station and the new integrated bus terminal goes, as well as our work is how we connect into it. So as far as we understand it, uh, the, the subway is planning to replace the existing bus terminal on Triton in the middle uh, with something a little bit further east to have a better connection with the subway, but they are looking at how that interfaces to the west side of McCowan. We specifically ended our dedicated lanes on Ellesmere, knowing that the Scarborough team would be looking at how all of the bus routes that feed into that center have to be handled and where all of those local road improvements are. We also found in our work that going over to McCowan and trying to use McCowan to get north uh, to the, the buses uh, is more challenging because of the volume of traffic on McCowan, whereas Grangeway provides a better opportunity uh, to not mix the buses in with as much other traffic. So all of the teams are sort of all working together to herd all the cats in the same general direction to come up with a coordinated plan. So I think you're going to see some stuff starting to come out about the subway station, and that will also start to talk about when and how some of the local road improvements in that area uh, will be integrated with the, with the station work. And I'll just add that uh, the same place that you're on tonight, if you're on the Metrolinx Engage site, uh, there's links to the Scarborough subway um, 
uh, information. And as David highlighted, uh, additional meeting uh, information is coming out all the time. So I encourage you to follow that. And I, I don't remember their email address, but uh, certainly an email address and you can sign up for, for updates and get those as they come in. I'll maybe just chime in too in terms of the timing of improvements. So we know the Scarborough subway is planned to open in 2030. So we're working closely between Metrolinx and the City of Toronto to figure out which of our projects will go first. Will the BRT happen first and connect to the subway when it opens or would the subway open first and the BRT lanes uh, happen afterwards? So there's still some questions there that we need to figure out, but we're moving forward with, um, with this preliminary design to advance the project. That's great, thank you. Uh, we've had a few questions ha that have come through the chat here in the Zoom room, and I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, reading some of those. The first question we received in the chat is, is the new bus hub at Progress and McCowan going to replace the existing one attached to the Scarborough Town Center? Or, oops, or be in addition to the existing hub? Will Grangeway Avenue be widened and a singleized interse intersection be added at Ellesmere Road? So yes, the, the intention is that the, the current um, bus hub that serves the SRT will be integrated with a new hub on the east side of McCowan with the subway. And as David mentioned, you can find out more about that under the subways tab on Metrolinks Engage. We will be adding a traffic light at Grangeway and Ellesmere so that our buses can turn on and off with, with a dedicated signal phase. The actual widening of, of Grangeway will actually be part of the Scarborough subways team because they need to look at other bus routes in the area that are serving that uh, station and how they all work together and whether the Busby gets widened and does progress get flattened and, and other things like that. So. We're looking at the infrastructure on Ellesmere and how to get around the corner, and then the subway team will be looking from there north. But yes, a new traffic light will be introduced at Grangeway as part of this project. Okay, thank you, David. The Oshawa section shows no cycling facilities. Why? So ideally, where, we, where the road is wide enough, we put the cycling facilities immediately adjacent to the road. But what we found is there are a couple of pinch points like Pickering Village, downtown Whitby and downtown Oshawa, where there just isn't enough room from building phase to building phase to have everything that we wanted. So what we've done is we've been working with the local municipalities to look at their cycling networks and um, we're connecting to those. And the intention then is they will uh, provide a municipal uh, pathway that is parallel to us, but one block off. So for instance, in Whitby, in Whitby, the intention is to go up Raglan and across Mary Street and down Garden, where we can't squeeze. We're already down to three lanes through downtown Whitby. We don't have room for cycle tracks as well. When we get out into, into Oshawa, there's going to be two routes. At Thornton, you will either go up to Adelaide and across to the north or down and in Gibb. So those are consistent with, um, with Oshawa's um, cycling networks. So that was the only way we could fit it in and with everything else that's happening in the roadway. So we are working together to make sure that any other municipal um, uh, cycling facility that crosses is also well connected. So again, we're not only creating a transit network and a pedestrian network, we're also helping expand and create a full cycling network. Okay, thank you. Uh, this next question is two parts. Um, a similar system was implemented along Highway 7 in Markham a few years back. I noticed as a motorist, this made travel along Highway 7 almost painful. My travel times were a lot longer. The longer commute time, the more emissions from cars. Is there any data to suggest that the next emissions would decrease by implementing a similar system here? And the second part to the question um, maybe this is more about planning for future city growth, but given the cost, the construction headache, I don't actually believe center lane bus lanes on the road that's not overly busy is necessary. Could we just have the same result by just having buses every five minutes like the Finch West or Shepherd West buses in Toronto without the buses being in the center lane? 
So a lot to, a lot to unpack there. Um, I can read the second part over. Um, if well, you maybe I'll, to, I'll but... start, I'll start with some of the questions and if, I, if we forget something, you can kind of yep. remind us. Yep. So I'll that start at the good. end. So um, Finch Avenue West is actually, there's a, there's an LRT under construction right now to replace the Finch West bus. There's discussion about a Shepherd East LRT to replace all of the buses on Shepherd Avenue. What we found on Highway 7, uh, I worked on that project a number of years ago. We've seen a, a very large increase in transit ridership. We've seen a large increase in population and employment. The number of new businesses along there has grown and uh, to a great extent because of the increased accessibility for people who don't have to drive to go there. What we're doing in this corridor is somewhat similar in that we're protecting and preserving the same number of traffic lanes along most of the corridor as we have today. And then as growth happens, what will happen is the congestion increases and more people will then choose transit because it takes longer to drive. That same thing happened in on Highway 7 is that the traffic, the, the growth in that part of York Region actually exceeded what we had planned for. And while we're seeing a large growth in transit ridership, we're also seeing a large growth in traffic. So that congestion uh, would be even worse if we didn't have the thousands of people riding the Viva service that we have today. We're seeing the same thing along Highway 2 in all of our modeling. When we looked at with BRT and without BRT in the future, with BRT, we see less congestion on Dundas Street, Street or Kingston Road. We see less congestion on the North-South Roads. We see less congestion on neighborhood streets. And we see a greater number of people actually being moved in the corridor to be able to support the employment and the population that is projected to come to the region. So without public transit, we're going to choke on cars. What we're trying to do is get the transit in so that as people move into the region, they will see that as a viable service. And as I said, we'll, we'll not buy the second car. They will learn that they can get by with one car for, you know, the, the one spouse who has to, you know, drive up to uh, somewhere for their job or has a job in sales where they need to drive all the time. And the other spouse can take the, you know, BRT along the corridor to go to, to do the things they need to do. So it will work together. And what we're seeing is we, we need to, um, you know, this this is one of the things with the Bowmanville Go to take more people into downtown with North South services. We create a virtuous circle of more and more service that attracts more and more riders. And that's the only way we're going to control the rate at which congestion increases. That was part of the question. Did I, is there parts of that that I did get to? Um, well, the second part of the question was, is um, essentially asking, you know, is there a better way to build this infrastructure without using center lanes, bus lanes? So we we looked at we looked at options along this corridor of looking of operating in mixed traffic and just you know pri giving bus priority. And what we find is that it does not give the reliability and the performance that's necessary to encourage people to try transit. Um, if you think about it, would you would you rather take a bus uh, in mixed traffic to go all the way to downtown Toronto, or would you rather take the subway downtown, or would you rather take the GO train into downtown? What we see with the people who want to travel into downtown Toronto is they want to be on something that is completely separated from and completely independent of road traffic. And so we, what we've tried to do is balance the number of people that we can are going to carry in this corridor with the cost of doing it. And so bus rapid transit is very efficient that way. It's basically two lanes of roadway and the only interaction with cars is at signalized intersections. This was extremely successful in Ottawa. Ottawa is now building light rail, but the only reason they're building light rail in Ottawa is because for the last 30 odd years, they have had a bus transit system with separated roadways for transit buses to get in from the suburbs. So they built ridership demand by allowing local buses in different communities to use dedicated roadways completely separated from cars to get close to downtown and then travel a short stretch of downtown in mixed traffic and then do the same thing at the other end. We're trying to do the same thing here. If we don't have segregation, if there's a day when there's a, a bad snowstorm, a bad rainstorm, a, a major traffic accident somewhere, an incident on Highway 401, all of those cars will, will jam up the roads and the buses won't move. 
what I find living in the city is that I don't care whether there's a big accident on on Bloor Street because I'm on the subway running underneath Bloor Street and I'm not affected by it. So I choose public transit because I know it's almost always 25 minutes from my stop into downtown. I don't know that when I'm driving. And that's the same thing that we're starting to see in Durham region is that the it, the congestion gets to a tipping point where suddenly everything starts to break down and it takes longer and it's not predictable. If it's not predictable, I have to build that extra time into my travel every day. And if I have to build that into my travel every day, that's more time that I'm spending commuting. So the dedicated lanes gives us the reliability we need to make sure that we can get from downtown Oshawa to downtown Pickering in 40 minutes every day. And that's what's going to give people encourage people to take public transit all the time is because it will be predictable and they don't have to say well yeah but every other every third day it takes an hour so I have to plan an hour every day and then I get to work 20 minutes early most of the time it needs to be reliable it needs to be separated from traffic that's the only way transit will be successful Maybe I know we're getting really close to the top of the hour, but I wanted to just add a couple of points uh, building on what David said. And I believe the question also included something about emissions and the emissions generated by by congestion and by traffic. So um, all of the th great things that David mentioned, as well as some of the you know congestion elements, those are all captured through the business case analysis. So MetroLinks has quite robust guidance where we try to take all these benefits, the travel time savings, um, as well as uh, congestion benefits, uh, emissions, and quantify that so that we can do this benefit cost analysis. And the project was assessed in 2018 and found that it is a good return on the public dollar to invest in these dedicated transit lanes. And we'll be updating that analysis uh, for the preliminary design that we have now to again, just check in. It's part of the decision-making process as part of the funding approval process to make sure that there's still good value for money here. And, and as David was saying, we think that the dedicated lanes for transit is, is definitely gonna provide good value. That's great. Thank you. Okay, the next um, message, the, the next question that came through in the chat. If we do this, is it possible to get an off ramp at Liverpool going east on the 401 and an eastbound on ramp at Liverpool? This would eliminate the some of the congestion on Kingston Road for those who get off at White's and have to travel east or those who have to travel to Brock to go east on the 401. Um, I, I, we have um, we really haven't looked at um, changes to Highway 401 as a way to improve mobility. That that's under the jurisdiction of, of the Ministry of Transportation. So I think we can uh, take that issue back and ask them. I know they are looking at at modifying on ramps and off ramps and and other ways to improve highway performance all the time. Sometimes there there are other challenges in terms of if the, how far does that on ramp need to go and does it conflict with the next off ramp so there there are some technical challenges as to where mto can and can't add ramps but we'll definitely uh, bring that forward okay any suggestions where uh, this this person can direct that question if they send us an email we will uh, send it through and get back to them as to who they should talk to i, I don't okay. know off the top of my head who who we should contact okay. that's good that's helpful Okay, the next question. Have you done any studies on the effect of businesses and jobs when you take away the option of having left-hand turns in and out of driveways? If you have, can we see them? So our, our traffic report has looked quite extensively at, at the change in travel pattern by not having the left-hand turns. As Margaret has mentioned, one of the key things under Vision Zero is the safety. So we see a significant, on, on Highway 7, we've seen a 50 to 75% reduction in the number of accidents. It also makes it safer for pedestrians and cyclists because we don't have all the conflicts of extra turning movements when motorists are looking for other cars, but not for pedestrians. So we see a definite safety improvement. What we have seen is yes, uh, that will result in more traffic making left turns and U-turns at signals, but that's done under a controlled dedicated phase. So that gives good control and everyone at the intersection knows who's moving and we get a lot of safety. We do know that that does add a few seconds to people's uh, travel. We do know that some people will change the way they move around, um, uh, but 
we found on Highway 7 uh, and, and other parts on the Viva network and, and other places that uh, once people get used to it, it really doesn't change things. We've seen a, a, a substantial increase in the number of businesses along Highway 7 who are attracted uh, by the transit facility. So I think that offsets uh, some of the, the challenges of moving around. I think it, it really is a just takes a couple of weeks for people to get used to and then you won't really in a year you won't even remember you used to do it a different way. Okay, that's great. Well, maybe just to add to that in terms of business supports, I think, you know, Metrolink, City of Toronto, Durham Region all really understand the importance of business along the corridor and this project is meant to support businesses, not certainly not to hurt them. So as we mentioned, there'll be community liaison committees uh, that Metrolinks will set up as the project moves forward into detailed design. And, you know, we've got a couple of years before construction starts, so there's time to plan um, so that businesses can communicate to their employees, to their customers. Uh, if there's logistics around deliveries that need to be coordinated, we've got time to plan all of that out. And I I'll speak for Metrolinks um, that, you know, Metrolinks is committed to support that. Maybe David Felp, if you wanted to jump in on that too. No, that's absolutely right. And I think we're always looking at and we also look with our municipal partners. I know on a, on some of these challenging locations, the, you know, the conversations with the uh, the partners have been very helpful in terms of, you know, looking at the way the local road network can support uh, businesses as well as, uh, you know, through those measures. So I think it's absolutely, uh, you know, it's absolutely something that it's a change, but it's a, a change that people adapt to, I think, is is the experience that we have. And I, you know, I even think of other locations in the in the Toronto area that when I was a kid it was all uh you know left turns and drive well not a kid but when I was a younger person all you know you could turn left and it was all up but as the as those streets have matured you know you, you get uh, less uh, private driveway uh, left turns and it you know the businesses are thriving and uh, and successful so I, I think it's uh you know it's it's a reasonable change and it's something that uh, can work very well Okay, are there any thoughts of increasing bus service north on Kingston Road, um, Altona, White, Brock, Salem, etc.? What are plans for this? So Durham Region Transit will be looking at improvements. They're constantly looking at how to allocate resources, where there are riders. If there are people who are traveling that way, they will add more buses. So it's a, it's a matter of they have to meet a specific cost ratio they have to be able to operate service that people are using they're constantly looking for that they're looking at um, improvements on some north south routes um, and so that is a, an ongoing process with durham region transit we know we're, we're planning for this corridor to be frequent we may not be able to make all of those north south routes as frequent in the short term but the difference will be if one route is on a 15 minute service but your east west route is there as soon as you want it you don't have to wait twice. So you'll be able to get on in Scarborough Centre or get on in downtown Oshawa get, without having to think about it, without having to plan ahead, get to your stop, and then you might have to wait a little bit longer for that secondary route. But that takes away having to guess and wait for travel on Highway 2 and then guess and wait for travel north on White's Road. So it's a virtuous circle where we improve service on one corridor it encourages more people to travel cycling will allow people to cycle further to get to the route so more people will be taking transit when they start doing that more riders brings in more revenue gives the opportunity for durham to introduce more service so that's the uh, the way things will work so um, durham region transit is definitely always looking to plan and expand. I think the regionalization of transit has gone a long way to equalizing service and providing things that connect, you know, Whitby and Oshawa and then Ajax and Pickering in ways that didn't happen 10 years ago. So that's always uh, um, moving ahead. But if you have questions about those routes, you should be also contacting Durham Region Transit directly. They may not be thinking of a route on a certain street because there isn't anybody out there now. But if they knew that there were a whole bunch of people in your neighborhood who would take it if it was there, they might be willing to start something up and try it. So please contact them as well. That's great, thank you. We do have uh, another person here in the Zoom room, Heather, uh, who would like to ask a question at this time. So Heather, if you wanna go ahead, um, this will be the last uh, question we'll take this evening. My, cons my concern is emergency vehicles. 
because we've got a fire there. station at West Neen too, and with making a one west westbound lane, where are we supposed to put our cars when we have to yield to the uh, fire engines, ambulance, police cars, etc., that are going by? Are we going to pull up? Person here in the Zoom room, Heather, uh, who would like to ask a question at this time. So, Heather, sorry, Heather, do you mind oh, sorry, just you... muting the presentation? Uh, question will take this evening. Okay, well, give me a minute. I'm here. Yeah, so we, we just, you're, you're, it's playing and we're, we're getting feedback. But yes, we have been talking with emergency services. So fire, ambulance, police will be able to use the, the BRT lanes. So in areas like downtown Whitby, where we only have one general lane and one BRT lane, cars will pull over to the curb the way they do today, and the emergency vehicles will use the red striped BRT lane. So emergency vehicles will be able to use the lane. We're working with them to see if there are additional places other than signalized intersections where they need to get across the barrier at some of the uh, unsignalized un side streets. So we'll be looking at a, a different configuration of the median to allow them to cross over. They've specifically said to us that they would prefer to see the buses in dedicated lanes in the middle of the road because uh, when the bus is sitting on the curb, they don't know whether the bus driver is allowing passengers off the bus who might come out around the front in order to cross the street, so they have to slow down. If the bus is out in the middle of the road, in the BRT lanes in the median, they will only ever be discharging passengers when they're sitting at a stop, so they can, they can anticipate what the bus drivers are doing. So we have seen that work very successfully uh, in... Uh, in, in York Region with the emergency services using the BRT lanes. So again, if there is an incident and the general traffic lanes are jammed, there's nobody in the BRT lane except the buses and the ambulances uh, and, and fire trucks can get to incidents uh, as fast as they do today, if not faster. So that's all and been I, thought of. And I'll just add, um, sort of come full circle, Jocelyn started the evening with a, a safety moment. And that's, you know, it's not just something we do in the, in the, uh, at the start of our meetings. It is our focus uh, on safety. So we're not interested in doing things that would create un unsafe conditions for our riders, for the public, for, for anyone. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's always our priority. And uh, as David highlighted, we work uh, closely with the uh, emergency services when we're developing these kinds of systems and we, we wouldn't do it any other way. We're not, uh, we're not, nothing, we're not going to prioritize anything other, over safety uh, ever. So that's, uh, that's our commitment on that. Thank you very much. We've had a lot of engagement here in the Zoom room, and we know the event is scheduled till 8 p.m. So uh, thank you for hanging on with us here um, to take some of those extra uh, questions. Um, thank you again for taking the time to join us this evening and for those fantastic questions and comments. I'd like to now hand it back to my colleague Jocelyn for some closing comments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to everyone who took the time to join us for tonight's event. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, we did get a lot of great questions, comments, and feedback on the DSB RT project, and we appreciate the interest and continued input. So just a reminder that Public Information Center number four will be open on Metrolinks Engage until November 11th, 2021. Um, so you can go ahead and use the interactive map and comment um, on all of the material available there. Um, and this evening's live presentation, as well as answers to questions that we weren't able to address, will be posted on Metrolinks Engage, so to this um, event page where you're viewing now. And the dedicated community engagement team can be reached via email at dsbrt at metrolinks.com or by submitting a feedback form on Metrolinks Engage. Um, lastly, I know that Stephanie had mentioned it, but we do encourage you if you do get the post event survey um, on this evening's event to please fill it out because it does help guide us um, towards improvements and next steps with these virtual um, engagements. So that would be wonderful if you could take a few minutes to do that. Um, and once again, thanks for joining. Stay safe and good night. Bye-bye.